Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Prine, and today I am joined by my friend, colleague, and hero of a very special kind, Carol Ann Garrett. Welcome, Carol Ann. Thank you very much, Peter. Happy to be here. Um, I'm delighted you're here. This is a conversation I've wanted to have for a long time. Um, and I hope the audience will, at the end of the hour, understand why. Um, so as you know, Caroline, one of the things I like to do is have my guests introduce themselves and I always learn something about them in that process. So would you, what would you like our listeners to know about you? Um, okay, well, I was born and raised in England. I have four brothers. Um, so it was an English family. Uh, between my oldest brother and youngest brother, there were only four years and eight days. So there were twins 11 months after me. So we were very close at age, all grew up together. And so I was a tomboy, um, did everything they did. And then we came over, <clears throat> excuse me, came over to the States when I was about 10. Uh, so we had an American education, but with English parents, we were brought up with a very, very strictly um when it was time for college I didn't know what I wanted to be or do I was always good at maths and sciences uh, so I thought I'd be a math major but I did know that I wanted to try whatever I was going to do before I graduated so I went to a school that had a cooperative education uh system at Drexel University and um there I didn't realize it but 75 percent were engineers I mean, it was mainly an engineering program. So I learned about engineering and I thought, wow, that's ex that fits me. I like I always like to fix things, take things apart, put them back together. So that's what I wanted to do. And um, surprising to me, it was the first time my dad ever said, that's a that's a guy's thing. That's I, I never remember what whole time I was growing up ever hearing that until that point in time. Anyway, I became an engineer went every other semester and worked. When I worked for his company back in England one summer, the chief engineer said, only guys can be engineers. And so that's probably where my dad got it from, um, kind of parroting what the chief engineer always said. Anyway, by the end of the summer, he said, okay, women can become engineers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I finished as a manufacturing engineer, loved manufacturing, not the design side, the manufacturing side. Um, worked for several companies as a manufacturing engineer, worked my way up through management, ran the manufacturing department, then all of the manufacturing in the, the factory itself, then the whole, the whole company. But we were always uh, a conglomerate. So I always had a, a boss somewhere in headquarters, but I got to run the operation. Had a great career, enjoyed myself, retired early, and um, then flew for the rest of my life. So now uh, tell us about that. H how did you get involved in aviation? What drew you to it? That was my dad as well. He always wanted to become a pilot. And when we moved to the States, there are a lot more opportunities in the States than there are in England. Um, so when everything was settled, um, he finally started taking flying lessons. Uh, a couple of us, one brother and, and I both worked at the airport. I worked in the office. He worked out as a line boy, um, cleaning windows, filling gas tanks. And he was a natural. We both took lessons. While my dad was taking lessons, we took lessons as we earned the money. Um, he was a natural, soloed on his 16th birthday, licensed on his 17th birthday. I was not a natural. <laughs> I soloed before college. And then after college, I went back to it and got my license and continued doing a little bit of flying, but work got in the way. And then um, late 90s, I went back to it and um, just got bitten by the bug the second time. Not as much the first time, but the second time, just fell in love with it. And now I fly as much as I can. <laughs> That's a great story. Um, so one of the things that I think is special about you is your relationship with uh, the disease ALS and how you got involved in fundraising for ALS research. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, ALS is amyotropic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. Unfortunately, my mother died of that. So, I mean, it's one, it's a disease that not many people have heard about because it's an orphan disease. But once you've it's been in the family and you know about it, you want to, or at least I wanted to do something to, to help. Um, and 
well, I don't know, I guess you do know now about how it affects the person, but it's the neurons, it's a motor neuron disease, it's the neurons in the, in the brain that quit firing, and then the muscles that quit working. And it tends to start at the extremities. So my mother had a, a dropped foot one morning, her foot wouldn't lift up anymore. Uh, some people start tripping, um, but it usually starts on the legs and works its way up. Uh, typically, after you're diagnosed, you have three to five years before you die. And it ends up just coming in from the extremities and you die of um, lung respiratory failure. Um, but your mind works 100% the whole time. You know everything that's going on. It's kind of like the opposite of Alzheimer's. Um, and you're aware of everything that's going on. And you know that some you're losing some muscle function every day, every week, every month. It's, it's getting more difficult. Um, so yes, I lived with or helped my dad and uh, wanted to do something at the end. My mother chose where all the money goes to ALS uh, Therapy Development Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, so she'd selected that one. And then afterwards, I started doing things to, to raise funds and raise awareness for ALS. So most people, when they approach something like that, it doesn't occur to them to do something like fly around the world. Uh, <laughs> so how did you make that leap and what did you end up doing? Okay, well, it wasn't, it, it didn't just tie in automatically. I didn't say, okay, I'm going to do this because, and actually it was never a dream of mine to fly around the world. It just, it kind of just happened. Um, so after my mother died in 2002, my dad decided that he wanted to be reunited with his sister who had married a Kiwi, a New Zealand guy after World War II and she'd moved to New Zealand. She'd lost her husband and they'd only seen each other once since World War II. So now he, my dad had just lost uh, my mother, his wife, and he kind of had the need to get back together with his sister. And so I was going to fly with him. He was 80 by then. So I was going to fly with him commercially. And then I just happened to read an article about a Mooney being ferried to, to Australia. And I already had a Mooney. That was the kind of plane that I had. Um, so I thought, wow, that would be really neat to get my plane to New Zealand since he'd passed his love of aviation on to me to get it to New Zealand, fly him around New Zealand, fly him to his sisters, get them reunited. Then he had friends on the east coast of Australia, fly him to Australia, get them reunited, then put him on a plane. And then in the planning process, I thought, I don't want to do the Pacific twice, so I'll just keep going. And that's how it happened. Wow. And so how did the fundraising mechanism? Oh, right. So I started planning that trip and I thought, well, it's silly not to make some good come out of it. And so I designed a website. This was back in the early days of websites when you could get a website for dummies book. And I made my own website and um, asked that donations all go to ALS research. And so during the trip, money came in and I was pretty happy with that. And then at the end of the trip, people, especially around Florida, invited me to make presentations um, to tell them about the trip. And so flying groups and clubs and civic groups all wanted these presentations. And then they would say, oh, you have to write a book about this. And I would say, oh, no, I don't. But then I thought about it and I thought, wow, if some good can come from it. So, and I already had all the websites, so I had all the details. And so I put it together into a book, self-published a book, and then did more and more presentations. People bought the books and I was able to raise about $80,000 for ALS research. Wow, that's So it, I thought that was pretty good. Absolutely. And then this idea kept coming into my brain and I couldn't get rid of it. And it said, well, if you can make $80,000 for research, just doing a flight around the world, maybe you could make more if you set a world record or break a world record. So that's how the second one got started. Um, I looked into it and the existing world record flying around the world westbound was 54.6 miles an hour. And that's I, when you consider the, the time for a world record, the clock starts ticking when you take off from your first airport and keeps ticking all the time you're you're flying all the time you're on the ground, the clock's still ticking. So that's how the, the speed is so low relative to how fast a plane flies. So 
I started doing some research. I took 18 months of preparation and planning and um, finally figured out how to do it, recruited a female co-pilot because if I'd had a male co-pilot, it would have been assumed that he did all the work. So we had to be two women up, <laughs> two women up front there. Um, and in 2008, December 2008, we followed our plan and, and did it and landed back in Orlando with a new world record of 115 miles an hour. Wow. That is a significant increase over the last record. More than double. Yep. We were very happy. And what do you suppose allowed you to make such a significant uh, increase in the record? Um, very short stops, very few and very short stops. So some people do it more leisurely. We did eight stops, nine flight legs. Uh, I think there were three hotels. Otherwise, we were sleeping in the plane the whole time. Um, so, so yeah, it's the ground time that's critical. It's not the speed of the plane. Got it. Got it. And then I wrote another book, made more presentations, and we were over $300,000 for ALS research. Wow. That is remarkable, Carolyn. That is extraordinary. Wow. Well, I, it's not me. It's the donations that come in. Right. I just had all the fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm guessing not every moment was fun. Can you give us Can you give us a thumbnail sketch of what it's like to fly around the world? Um. Well, the second one was very difficult um, in that it was almost nonstop, very tiring, fatiguing. And that's why the, the co-pilot that I chose, her name's Carol as well, um, she has Mooney. I wanted any fatigue reactions to be Mooney reactions. I didn't want somebody with a different plane. When they're tired, they might not react the same way. So we both have Moonies. So when we were tired, we would know how to land how to how to fly the plane um so, so we didn't see much on that one i mean we followed our plan we had people on the ground sending us information uh winds weather that kind of stuff but otherwise it was it was a torturous trip whereas the first one seven months more leisurely got to stop in lots of places new zealand uh see friends and family in new zealand and australia i mean just a lot more fun. So yeah, don't, <laughs> I tell people, don't try and set a world record. Enjoy <laughs> when you go, enjoy yourself, take your time. Most people don't do it twice or even three times. So enjoy the time when you do it. Oh, well, that's good advice. Um, so, so yes, then because I didn't see anything on the second trip, I had to do a third trip. <laughs> so it was several years later, I, I did it nice and slowly eastbound this time because some people choose west, some people choose east. I thought, I got to see why people go east. And so I try, I try to eastbound. And it is easier across the Atlantic the first time. Um, and then I did uh, lots of time in, in um, Europe, Middle East, Africa, uh, Madagascar, which I'd never been to before. Just, just really enjoyed my time. I had six co-pilots that joined me for different legs. So it was fun watching them see and how they reacted to the flights and to the different places. So that kind of gave me a, another perspective on flying around the world by seeing it through their eyes. So that was a lot of fun. And then um, what I tell people afterwards is as you're heading east, you always have the idea of the Pacific in your mind. And it's a huge body of water and it scares a lot of people. And when you go in westbound, you get that over and done with, and then you can enjoy the rest of the trip. When you're going eastbound, it's always in the back of your mind, worrying you. And many people stop in Australia or New Zealand or Indonesia or Japan, and they get stuck because the huge part is now there. So, I mean, when my time came, I, I just was New Zealand, um, Tonga, uh, Christmas Island, Hawaii, um, and then back to the States. It was, it was still, I found it more difficult going eastbound than westbound because of the huge Pacific. But I had a great time. Um, came back, wrote another book, did more presentations, and we've raised over $500,000 for ALS research. 
Wow. I had no idea about this, Caroline. No idea. That is absolutely extraordinary. Good for you. Well, thank you. Yes. I, the difficult part, and I can't imagine being the scientists at ALS TDI, coming up with these potential um, treatments, thinking they've got it, starting the clinical trials, only to come to the end of the clinical trials, and it doesn't prove there isn't enough statistical statistical evidence that it's it can reduce the the symptoms or or stop the the progress of ALS. So they go through highs and lows all the time. And I'm happy to donate as much as I can and raise as much as I can, but those people are the real heroes. They're they're still struggling, still trying to find a treatment. And they'll get there. They will get there. It's just a difficult process. And so are your books still for sale? Yes, they are. I still have quite a few of them. What are their titles? Um, did I say I'm not very creative? Okay. okay. <laughs> the first one is Upon Silver Wings, because the wings are grayish silver. So the second one's Upon Silver Wings 2, and the third one's Upon Silver Wings 3. <laughs> hey, that works. So I will include links to buy the books in the comments uh, after we do the video. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, so one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is, uh, as you know, I believe in the importance of gender equality. And um, I am just interested if you could say a little bit about, um, you know, what are your experiences of women in the field of aviation generally? Uh, there aren't enough of us. Okay. The, the numbers since back in Amelia Earhart's time are women are 6% of the total, total pilot population. And it's still 6%. And it's unbelievable. I mean, doctors, lawyers, they're 37 to 40%. Air traffic control has the people that are in the towers speaking to us on in the planes. They're all the way up to 17%. But pilots are still 6%. And even worse, airplane mechanics are less than 3%. Wow. So it's a field that hasn't treated women equally or women don't have the desire to get into it. Um, I, I, I think things are slowly starting to change in schools. They're seeing a lot more young women get into schools um, learning how to fly. Um, on the radio, you're hearing, I'm hearing more and more women on the both air traffic controllers and pilots talking. So it is slowly starting to change. But I think there are a couple of things holding it back. There's the, the danger. It's still seen as dangerous. I mean, we have millions of flight hours every year. And if there's an accident, it makes the news. Car accidents don't make the news. So there's still that impression by people that it's dangerous. And women really don't want do less dangerous things than men, I would say. Um, but there is a huge, there's going to be, there is right now, and it's going to get bigger and bigger, a lack of pilots for the airlines. And so they're recruiting like crazy. And that could be good for getting more women. I think it is already because we're seeing them in flight schools, getting more women into aviation. I'm hoping the number goes up to 7% this year. <laughs> and I hope it gets, uh, we get more and more women into it. Well, do you have any specific stories about uh, women pilots, you know, whether they're accepted or not accepted or treated equally that you've encountered? Um, well, I was never in the airlines, but I have friends that were in the airlines and they tell me that once you get into the airlines, um, they're, they're treated equally the whole time. You get your seniority number and everything, all promotions, everything from then on go on your seniority number all your bids for, for the when you want to fly, where you want to fly, everything else is based on that number. They say they never felt any inequality the whole time they were with the airlines. So I think that's, that is great news. Yeah. Now getting to that stage, I think is difficult. Uh, instructors uh, sometimes aren't good with women students. Um, so I think we still have difficulty getting to that stage. The good news is once they're there, things seem to be okay. 
Now, I can't say the same thing for corporate pilots or other pilots. I don't know what it's like in, in those areas. But the airlines, yes, they're treated equally. That is so fascinating to hear. Um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because uh, I think aviation is a really fascinating case study around gender equality for many of the reasons you've talked about. And, you know, my thumbnail sketch of what it takes to achieve gender equality, whether it's in a profession or a community or a country, is you really need to do two things. Uh, you need to increase the numbers, but you also need to make cultural changes. Um, and those are very specific to the specific profession or context. And one of the things um, that I know you're aware of is that over the last several decades in aviation, um, particularly looking at airline flying, there has, I think, been a successful culture change, particularly in decision-making in the crew environment, that there were some very spectacular accidents where essentially it was caused by faulty decision-making on the part of the captain, and that really jump-started what people call crew resource management or cockpit resource management, training pilots to think of other crew members as resources. And the research is very clear that uh, you, if you diversify perspectives, you enhance the quality of decision-making. And uh, you know, I think aviation accidents have decreased as a result of that. So I'm just fascinated that there's this example of aviation where there has been cultural change, uh, which is usually the opposite, but there have we still have single digit numbers. And I'm just wondering if you have any other thoughts about that. Uh, yes, there needs to be cultural change. Um, there are two big air shows, Oshkosh um, in Wisconsin and Sun and Fun in Florida. And I go to the, I used to go to Oshkosh all the time, but it interferes with my soaring season. So, but I go to Sun and Fun in Florida every April, March or April. And um, they have a lot of booths where people, where all the companies are selling their wares to the pilots and their hangars are just full, full, full of all these companies. And I go around and get, do all my shopping at, at Sun and Fun. A friend who's a pilot who then got married, went around Sun and Fun with her husband she said, it's as if she doesn't, uh, it's as if she's not even there. They only address the mail and she can be right there. She can be the one expressing more interest and they focus on the mail. So uh, it's not the airlines, it's, it's everything for general aviation getting up to the airlines. If, if you're with a male, I mean, if you're a female pilot going through these booths and looking for things with a male, you will be treated as if you don't even exist wow. when i'm going through by myself no problem because i'm the only one there they have to they have to talk to me but that was her feedback when she's going through there with with uh with her husband wow that doesn't send the right message from those companies absolutely not and i'm just curious if you're ever in a situation like that how do you how do you cope? What are there things that you say or have you learned to do? Or oh, she won't go through with her husband anymore. <laughs> she does her shopping by herself. Wow. She won't go through the booths with him. Wow, that is so sad. It is. It is. How would how do you teach these companies that females are equal pilots and they need to talk to both of them equally? Wow. Hmm. So I mean, in a similar fashion, a funny story. When I was in India on my first trip, I had a co-pilot with me. He wanted to visit a certain part of the world or do a certain part of the trip with me. And he joined me in Malaysia, flew with me to India and rejoined me in South America, South Africa. Anyway, so we, were, we landed in India and the, the people that are going to uh, do all the paperwork and take care of the plane and everything else come and meet you right on the ramp. And so he's standing here, I'm standing here, and they're addressing him because they assume he's the pilot. And he points to me and I answer the question. The next question they address to him again. He points to me, I answer them. The next question they, they could not address me and ask me the question directly. Every single time it went around the triangle. I mean, we do expect that, we shouldn't say expect, I mean, it does happen in, in other countries. We don't expect that in the States and yet it exists here also. So meanwhile, I know that you are doing what you can to address this in a several ways. So can you tell us about your work with Young Eagles and Cross Country Women? 
Young Eagles is a great program. It was started back in 2000 by the EAA, the Experimental Aircraft Association. Brilliant idea. We pilots love to fly. We love to introduce people to, to flying and take people flying when we can. And so they came up with this idea of having a program where we pilots take kids for flights. And they have chapters all over the states. And they go, each of the chapters organize it however they want to. EAA came up with the paperwork and the liability and all the rest of the forms. But each chapter runs either one a month or one a year or two a year or every quarter, however they want to run it. And they bring kids or invite kids from schools, homeschool kids, however, Boy Scout groups, Girl Scout groups, however they can or get the kids and say, hey, we're giving free flights on this day at this airport, and then organize that. And as a pilot doing it, it is just so much fun. You get the kid, you walk them out to the plane safely, teaching them ramp safety, um, walk them around the plane and tell them about pre-flighting the plane to make sure the plane's ready to go flying. You get them in with their seatbelt and shoulder harness and headset on and let them listen to the radio and the weather. And you tell them everything <clears throat> Excuse me, that's going to happen as you progress, then you talk to the tower and taxi out and take them flying and the one in the right seat, if they so choose, he or she can get to fly. Most of them say yes. Every once in a while, they say no. Unfortunately, it's usually the girls that say no. Um, and the girls that also that want to stay in the back and not come in the front, that happens. And then, I mean, several of them afterwards say, shoot, I should have gone up front. <laughs> so that's good to see they've learned something from it. Take them flying, come back. I mean, it is a great program. And so by 2010, over a million kids had been introduced to aviation. And now it's over, it's over 2 million. So yeah. fantastic, fantastic program. Kids that would never otherwise have been introduced to aviation, think about it. Um, a lot of the EAA chapters have started ground school. So every Saturday for 10 weeks, they do a more thorough introduction to aviation. And then a lot of kids now, who would never have thought of becoming pilots or anything in aviation are now becoming pilots. So great, great program. That is so beautiful. And just to clarify, does it cost the kids anything? No, no, absolutely free. Absolutely free. And then there's another group, Women of Aviation Worldwide. And they're a very small women's pilots group. And they do something. It's the week around March 8th every year, because the first woman pilot to get her pilot's license was March 8th. Um, I don't remember the year, 1912 or somewhere around there. Anyway, so, um, so they run a similar program. And I used to do it with under their auspices in Ocala in March. And what we did was we would have a woman instructor running the ground school, we telling them about, about how the planes work and navigation and everything else. We'd have a woman mechanic showing them the plane, the engine, the instruments. We had a woman air traffic controller in the tower that told them all about her job as an air traffic controller. We had women pilots giving them their young eagles flight. And then they all came back at the end and we had a career session where all these women spoke about their, their careers we had military, women military pilots talk about uh, their careers, um, uh, police pilots talk about their careers, the airline pilots talk about their So for a morning, we only had aviation women talking to these girls about aviation. So a little bit different from Young Eagles, where you get 20 boys and one girl. This was all girls and all women in aviation. So we kind of pulled the wool over their eyes for a morning, letting them think <laughs> that it's a women's thing. <laughs> and I hope it worked. Wow, that is amazing. I didn't know you did that. And when you're doing that, when you're looking at this room full of girls, looking at you know a group of women examples as elders in the profession, do you just get a, a sense of what it's like for the girls to see all women professionals? Yes, I think we did pull the wool over their eyes for 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 that morning. They only saw women associated with them aviation. It was easier for them to relate, and more questions came when the pilots were younger. the The woman mechanic was younger, closer to their age. They could talk to her. Some of the airline pilots were older. We have gray hair, so we're not as close to them in age, and it. it 
if we could get more women closer to their age, it would have been better. And we did get a, a few more. Uh, but the parents were there at the same time. So especially in the career session, the parents got to hear hear it straight from the, the women that were talking as well as their daughters. So it, it was good for everybody. That is so beautiful. I can't offhand think of another professional event in any profession where I've heard it done in that way. It's such a great idea. Yeah. Well, given your wide ranging career and incredibly diverse experiences in aviation, um, uh, one of my favorite questions is to ask folks, you know, let's just say hypothetically, you were queen of the world. What would be one of your first official acts? Uh, queen of the world. Yep. Does that mean everybody has to do as I say, or that I have a magic wand to make anything happen? You know what? I'll, I'll leave that choice up to you. you and <laughs> Take it any way you want. Well, I mean, this is away from flying, and this is okay. somewhat based on things that we have talked about before, but if I had a magic wand, I would make all the governments in the world and the, the top level of government, more than 50% women. Because I have learned that things go better in the world when women govern, as in Finland, and there are other examples. And we would have fewer wars, better education, less poverty, less unemployment, and things would go better. So if I if I were able to do it, and if I could be the the good queen with the magic wand, that's what I would choose to do. Well, I'd vote for you ever queen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I thought it would be fun to give folks uh, a tour of your fleet. Uh-huh. That'd be okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, I've loaded up some pictures here, so I'm just gonna share them. So can you see that? Yes, I can see it. So Through tell the, me about, tell us about this plane. That's my Mooney. When I say Mooney, that is a Mooney airplane. It's my first plane. Um, when my mother was diagnosed with ALS, I was living in Pennsylvania and they were in Virginia, so I could get there very easily. And then my company tra uh, transferred me to Florida and I needed to get back to see my mother and help my dad out at least um, every month. So I searched for and found a Mooney. A Mooney is a very quick um, four-seater single engine plane. So I didn't look for any other planes. I only looked for a Mooney, found this Mooney and we've been all over the place together. You certainly so, have. Yes, initially it was purchased just so I could get back and forth to Virginia to, to help my dad and see my mother. But <laughs> since then we've had a great life together. Now, isn't it true that um, this is a hangar that's attached to a house? It is. Uh, tell us about that. I believe it's called an air park. Right, an air park. This one was actually called an air ranch, but right. air park is, is more typical. Private airport is another way of looking at it. So um, every house has its own hangar. Um, Usually, the, well, there's at least one pilot and at least one plane, often two pilots and more than one plane. And you taxi out from your hangar. Um, the roads are also taxiways. The cars have to get off the road and give way to the planes because planes can't back up. Um, so we taxi to the runway um, and then we make our radio calls and take off and land on that runway and then taxi back to our hangar and house. It is absolutely a fantastic lifestyle. <laughs> Everybody there is a pilot. Well, at least one member of the family is a pilot. Um, very typically, there is a mechanic on the field, sometimes two or three mechanics. Uh, very often, a number of uh, different people on the field are building their planes. So they have, if you need help, if you have questions, if you need tools, you don't have to buy every single tool you need. You can borrow the tools. Um, there are typically instructors on the field, depending on how many, how many houses and how many, um, people are on each air park. It is a fantastic way to live. Wow. I mean, so many like man, like-minded people, you don't know their, their backgrounds can be diverse as anything, but they have something in common and it's just a lot of fun. 
That's amazing. It is. And then tell us about this moment. Uh, that's landing and taxiing in in San Diego. So this is the end of the first leg of my 2008 world record attempt. So at this point, we're tired. We just finished 16 hours of flying and we're coming in for, for gas and reapprovisioning re of food for the next 15 or 16 hour leg to Hawaii. Yes, good memories. And um, then I guess one plane wasn't enough for you. Uh, so <laughs> tell us about this plan. Uh, so when I got finished my uh, first world flight in 2003, I knew I wanted to build a plane and I'd run into some people in England that have built this type of plane, which is a kit that you can get in the States. It's called a, a RANS. And Randy, who's the president of RANS, had designed, it's up to 22 different kinds of planes now. This is the S7. Um, and it's an excellent, excellent kit. So I bought the kit in 2004 and I finished the kit. This is it sitting on my ramp right before the test flight in 2006, December 2006. Um, so all the parts are provided. You have to <laughs> figure out how to get them together, uh, get the engine in and running, uh, get it signed off by the FAA. And now I'm ready for my test flight. And this is right after my test flight. I taxied back in. <laughs> A big smile. Everything went well. Um, and then we opened the bottle of champagne. So just to clarify, you built this airplane. Yes. Well, and I did, the, the parts, as I said, are provided. Some of the parts you have to make yourself. They give you the sheet metal or the or the um, pieces of metal, and you have to, to cut, drill, assemble. Um, but all the parts are provided. And approximately calendar wise, how long did it take? It took three years, uh, about 1600 hours oh. in the three years. Oh. Amazing. Yes, it's uh, it's amazing that we are allowed to build our planes and fly them. I mean, it's a uh, it's fantastic to be able to do it and and fly it and just know that it's something you built. And then it's, and it's still flying 1100 hours on it. Beautiful. And then apparently two airplanes wasn't enough for you either. Uh, so tell us about this craft. Uh, I never thought I would be a glider pilot. Um, but I was going out with this German guy who'd also flown around the world. We met at an Earth Rounder meeting. He got me hooked on soaring. I started soaring um, and then started soaring cross country. And once you start soaring cross country, which is going places and coming back, you are hooked for life. So I bought this, bought this glider. This is a self-launch glider. So the engine comes up from the back uh, so you can take, take off by yourself. The reason I never thought I would become a glider pilot is it requires so many other people to get it out to the ramp, to, to get yourself launched, to get yourself recovered if you run out of uh, lift and you land somewhere else, people have to come and pick you up. So uh, having a self-launch glider made gliding uh, achievable for me, something that I could do because I could do it by myself. I didn't have to have a, a huge group. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's, it's a tiny cockpit, one person. Uh, don't do it if you're claustrophobic, although you do have a great big canopy, so you don't feel claustrophobic. And it's just fantastic. The sights that you can see, I'm yes. pretty, low, pretty low on this one. But typically out here, the land is at 6,000 feet. We, we're flying at 18,000 feet. So you're 12,000 feet above, uh, above the ground. And you can just see forever and as no clouds here. Typically we need clouds. The clouds mark the thermals. So the thermals are made by the heat, the sun heating the ground, and then that gets some of the air to go up. And it tends to be over here, we can see some clouds. So you can go from cloud to cloud with the thermals lifting you up. Um, and that's how we move from place to place. I think this might be ridge soaring. I think it is. 
So in the another, so that's thermal soaring. Ridge soaring is when you have a, a a mountain or a ridge and you're going down the ridge the whole time. If the wind is coming up, it's just keeping keeping you up the whole time and you're just flying along the ridge. I mean, that's fun too. Here in New Mexico, we do a lot more of the thermal soaring. And my longest flight is over 400 miles. And next year I want to go even further. And how many hours is that? Uh, this year it was six hours because I'm getting faster. <laughs> My first, you get badges, you do, you do specific tasks and you get badges. So the first time I did a 500 kilometer flight, um, it was five hours and 47 minutes because I was slow. And so if you want to go further, you have to get faster. So you have to work on your speed, which means improved thermaling technique and then improved gliding technique. Um, and improve reading the clouds, reading the weather. I mean, there a lot goes into a ton of concentration goes into it. Um, but it's it's exhilarating. Um, great days are fantastic. Uh, frustrating days, <laughs> you come back and you could kick the chairs and get mad, but uh, you'll get better next time. <laughs> so we got a little sense of that from just those pictures, but I know you'd like to say that you sort of think of um, uh, being a ladder is sort of like the poetry of aviation. Are you able to add any more words to that about what the experience of being a, in a glider is like? Um, you can get a little bit of a sense uh, relative to a sailboat and a motorboat. I mean, it's peaceful instead of the motor running. Uh, you're at the mercy of the winds you can, in a sailboat, you can only go certain directions with the winds. We're the same way in the air. Uh, we have headwinds and tailwinds and crosswinds, but there's also so much thermal lift. There's also sink because the air goes up plump somewhere. It goes down somewhere else. And when you run into a sink line, it's torture because you can be coming down very fast and you have to get out of that sink line. It's, um, it's peaceful exhilarating and just requires a lot of concentrate if you want to go places a lot of concentration if you just want to stay around the airport and and go from cloud to cloud it can you can just have a, a fun afternoon you don't have to force yourself to go places and really work at it but if you choose to you can have an absolutely fantastic afternoon five hours six hours seven hours eight hours and hopefully get back to your home airport <laughs> sometimes not extraordinary well um i've just enjoyed so much talking to you uh i feel like i knew you pretty well and yet there's so many things i've learned about you that i didn't know and uh leave this conversation admiring even more and and just thinking about um i think just one image that will stay with me uh is that event you organized with all the um career women in aviation and the girls sort of taking all that in um, and I just think about how, you know, it's very human to only do the things in life where we see examples of people who look like us doing them. Um, and when you don't have those examples, it just may not occur to you. And so I just, one of the things I admire about you is I just feel like you're a living example of, of all of these things. You know, if there's some young woman watching this, who's wondering about, can they be a pilot? Can they build a plane? Can they fly around the world? And they fly around the world three times. Uh, you know, they they can know that they do that and uh, add to that all the charity work that you've done. Um, yeah, I just, I think it's very clear the world is a better place for you being here and I'm honored to know you. Well, thank you. Um, so I love to leave the last word to my guests. Are there any parting thoughts you'd like to share before we sign off? Well, it's the saying that's on my business card, the saying that's on the bottom of all my emails uh, that I tend to live by, which is live life, learn and share. So I try and get the most out of life by living life, learn as much as I can as I'm going through it and share it through my books, through talking with you, through through this time together, share it with other people because you're right, they can learn from it and they can maybe choose to do something that they wouldn't otherwise have thought of doing. Exactly. Beautiful words to end on. 
Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Carolyn, and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you very much, Peter. Me too. Bye. Yeah.